Welcome to Book Rising, a podcast by the Radical Books Collective. Welcome back, everyone. We are delighted to have Zimbabwean feminist scholar Rudo Mudiwa guest hosting this episode of Book Rising. Rudo is currently assistant professor of gender and sexuality studies at the University of California, Irvine. And in this episode, she chats with author Nana Darkua Sechiyama about her new book, The Sex Lives of African Women, Self-Discovery, Freedom, and Healing. Thank you all for joining me for the Radical Books, event, Radical Books Collective event um, titled Beware My Smile on Radical Desire. My name is Rudon Biwa, and I am an assistant professor of gender and sexuality studies at the University of California, Irvine. Um, and my wonderful guest today is Nana Darkoa Sekiyama, who is the co-founder of the blog Adventures from the Bedrooms of African Women. She's also the, the author of The Sex Lives of African Wo- uh, Women, uh, which I'm excited to discuss today. Um, Nana is an organizer and a writer who makes the tantalizing promise of Black women's congregation real through her work. To my mind, her work points to the liberatory potential of African feminist thinking and writing. Um, And when I was thinking about this introduction, I initially wanted to say that this book is not just about sex, because I wanted to point to the fact that it's really about the question, the challenge of freedom um, for Black women, uh, for African women, um, the, the struggle to, to find and live an independent life, uh, the struggle to know oneself. But then I thought, like, to say it's not about sex actually blunts the provocation of the book. It is about sex and about African women desiring it, healing from it and through it, and claiming it on their own terms. Um, so Nana, welcome. Um, it's really a pleasure to talk to you and I'm so excited to, to learn from you and to discuss this book with you today. Thank you so much, Rudo. It's really great to be here. And I was just smiling through your introduction. <laughs> so thank you for that very generous introduction. Um, yeah, so let's start by talking about, so um, you are the co-founder of this blog, uh, The Adventures of, from the Bedrooms of African Women, uh, which if people have not made that a part of their internet diet, they should. Uh, I myself uh, was a regular reader. I think I started reading it in ooh, 20, maybe 2014. Um, and I actually heard about it from other Zimbabwean feminists that I became a really avid reader. Um, and it was just like uh, such, it's a delicious treat. Like I would read <laughs> the entries and I think I was working on my dissertation and it was just like, man, this is, it was, it was feeding me while I was, um, while I was working on my dissertation to read these just juicy stories. Um, so what made you want to move from, you know, cultivating this really beautiful online space to wanting to put this anthology um, to move from one form to the other? Yeah, no, thanks for that. In a sense, I haven't moved from one form to the other because the blog still exists. It's still extremely vibrant. You know, it's just that I also wanted to create a book. And really, you know, part of what I've been doing for years with Malaika and all the other people who've been contributing to the blog is encouraging African women to share the experiences of sex, sexualities, and pleasure. And, you know, obviously on a blog you get, you know, 500 words, 600 words, 800 words. In a sense, you're getting a hint of a story. And just from all of those stories, I knew that there was so much out there when it comes to African women's experiences of sex and sexualities. And I knew those stories were not in the mainstream. They were on our blog, on other, you know, feminist sites, African feminist sites, but it wasn't part of the dominant narrative around African women's experiences of sex and sexuality. And I felt that what I would see as a dominant narrative was very negative. It was very limiting, um, especially in Western media. You know, African women would usually be portrayed as quite passive, as victims of, you know, domestic violence, women who had experienced FGM, who had been um, who were suffering from HIV and AIDS. And that may be part of the story, but I knew for sure it wasn't the full story. I knew we also had agency. We also experienced pleasure in our lives. And I wanted to basically interview African women from across the continent and the diaspora 
about the experiences of sex, sexuality and pleasure and, sh- and, and put that in a book because I think, well, I thought and I think I've been proven t- right that it would show just how wide ranging and how complicated and how complex and how interesting and how dynamic Asto is there. Yeah, yeah. The I mean, I when I emailed you, I told you like I couldn't read this book uh, <laughs> during the <laughs> book because I'm doing it at night because usually I have my little nighttime reading and I would read it at night and I would just get so like engrossed in the stories, but also so worked up like because the um, each of the stories are able to capture both. Like first of all, it is incredibly um, even for me. Like this is what I study, and I'm like it's incredibly rare to get um, this collection of African women talking so frankly about sex. And I felt like, you know, so like, I just, you know, here reading it, you know, is, is just something really startling about that. And I felt like, you know, when you're growing up in an African household um, and your, you know, your mother and her friends are talking or, you know, and then they see you listening, they say, get out, adults talk. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Adults are talking and then you get sent to your room and then that's when you know you're, they're talking about something good. <laughs> I felt like this is what that book feels like, you know, like it's good adult talk and they're talking about something good. Um, and so I felt this real pleasure in being able to listen to these stories um, or read these stories. But one thing that I thought your book did so well was that it captured like there's so much pleasure, but I was actually more taken by the fact that there's so much pain, right? And there's so much, like you're, you're able to do both really well. Like there's so much vulnerability that all these um, all these people are able to give you. Um, so I wanted you to talk a little bit about that. Like, you know, um, women are, you know, African women, um, uh, are seeking pleasure, but they're also making themselves so vulnerable. And, and I thought that was so beautiful how you captured that in this book. No, thanks so much. I mean, I think if I had my own way, this book would have just been about pleasure. But, you know, like pain is also part of our experiences, right? And so for me, it was really important to show really the breadth of our experiences. I think for me, what was helpful because some of the painful stories are really difficult the experiences of child sexual abuse for example I was rather shocked by how you know like you know certain things intellectually but then when you're confronted with it in a very visceral way it's like wow right and so asking women to tell me about their first sexual experience of their first memories of sex and for a lot of people that came from a place of child sexual abuse, that for me was like really, really shocking, you Mm. know? Um, I also realized during my interview process that there was a particular question that I was asking to, that was in a sense, inspiring people to tell me that story. And it was really that question, what was your first experience of child sexual abuse? At some point in time, I have to say, I stopped asking that question because it got a bit much, Mm. you know? but for me, it was important to be able to show both, right? And what for me was encouraging is a lot of people have found ways to heal, even from the very difficult traumatic experiences that they may have had as children. Yeah. 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 And I mean, just talk, maybe talk a little bit more about the process, right? Because um, one, I mean, you, when you read this book, it feels extremely intimate. So, um, and, and, you know, at the end of the book, you sort of talk about, wanting to do this project and being invited into into these women's homes. And I want to hear you maybe talk a little bit more about that. Like how, how did you, you know, enter this space with them, um, hold this space with them um, while they shared these stories that some of them, you know, as they tell them say, like, I've never told anybody this, you know, before. Absolutely. Well, I think part of what really helps is the fact that in a sense, I've been doing this work for a really long time. And so people have been sharing with me, over for well over a decade their own experiences around sex and so the very first person I interviewed for this book was a woman called Baba and she basically slid into my dms um, because she was confused about her sexuality and so she just wanted to have a conversation with someone that she felt would be open and non-judgmental and and so we had a bit of an exchange and that was the time I had also made up my mind I was going to write this book and so I said to her you know, I'm working on this book about the sex lives of African women. Can I interview you? She came to my house. The first time all we did was drink wine and just chat, 
right? Mm. And the second time she came around, we had a bit of a conversation. And the third time she came around, we finished the interview process. So for me, it was really important to make people feel comfortable, to make people feel safe, to meet them wherever they wanted to meet. There were some people I interviewed in their homes. At the beginning, it was really important to me to just do a lot of face-to-face -face interview. And in those times, clearly it was also pre-pandemic. I used to travel a lot for my job. So every time I went somewhere, I would just find someone to interview. People in introduced me to neighbors who they thought had interest in life. So for example, I inter interviewed a dominatrix from the UK and she was a neighbor of a friend, right? There were some people whose friends told them about this project and they reached out to me. Helen Banda from Malawi who lives in the States. She sent me a message on Facebook. And I saw that months later because I'm not very active on Facebook. So that was like part of the process. And I think it, it was really important to me to do the face-to-face -face interviews, to gain rapport with people. And I think maybe more importantly for me to also get comfortable with the level of questioning I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to write this in first person, which, means, which meant I almost needed to put myself in the shoes of people. Mm -hmm. It meant I needed a little detail. I needed to, you know... In a sense, be able to get a sense of what were they feeling, what were they seeing, what else was going on. Um, so lots and lots of questions. Um, also, people had the choice of whether they could be anonymous or whether they could use their own names. They didn't have to make that decision straight away. They could make that decision, you know, weeks or months indeed after we had done the interview. And I think that really all helped give people a sense of trust and confidence and enable people to open up. And a lot of people don't really get the chance to talk about sex, right? And, and so for a lot of people, yes, I was the first person that were telling some of the really difficult traumatic experiences they've had. And I think for me, what was also really helpful is it felt to me like for people that was also healing to be able to talk about subjects that they had never really been able to talk about before. Mm. Yeah, um, and I mean, one thing like that this book it's it's almost like it's hard for me to sort of uh, to to express the many things that this book does, and I am so excited that it's in the world because one thing that it accomplishes is that it really um, shows queerness in the in what I think is like a, uh, a compelling and challenging African feminist way, where queerness is not like this identity that can be claimed or stable. And I love the stories where people would be like, yeah, so, you know, um, I was having this experience and there's a woman I was attracted to. And so I just decided that one day I was gonna like try and see and sleep with her, right? Um, and I really feel like um, uh, there's this book by Gloria Fecker, which actually is on my desk right now, The Politics of Passion, um, which she, you know, has a sort of similar narrative where it, it's, you know, in, in Afro-diasporic cultures, right, queerness is not like the stable fixed thing that, you know, in Western culture, you have to like claim and you come out and it's this event and then you are fixed as a sort of like queer subject, right? And in this story, in this book, you see all this like just the flow of sexuality in really interesting ways. Um, and I was like so excited about that, that we have like this book to able to tell that story of a really situated Afro-diaspora queerness. So I don't, I don't know if, yeah, like that theme is really present in this, in this uh, collection. Yes, no, and I love that, right? Because I think, I personally think of sexuality as a spectrum. You know, I don't think our sexuality needs to be fixed. I think it could be changing. I think people may choose how they want to identify and they would have their reasons for, you know, identifying in a particular way. So what comes to mind, for example, is the story of Amena from Egypt, you mm -hmm. know, um, who identifies as a lesbian. And, you know, with her story, she really sort of tells us about her relationship with this one woman, how she came into her queerness also at the same time when they were out on the streets fighting for the revolution and how, you know, at the time that she, I was interviewing her, she had started to have sex with men and some people were trying to say, oh, that means you're bisexual. And she's like, no, I'm not bisexual. I'm a lesbian. You mm -hmm. can't tell me the fact that I've loved women my whole life and I've been in struggle with women my whole life. And now because I've slept with a man, you're trying to claim I'm bisexual. No, I'm not, you know? So I also love that. I love the fluidity of sexuality as well as people's insistence 
on what they wear. Um, and that was one of the questions I'd always ask people, how do you identify in terms of your sexuality, right? And how people identified did not necessarily match what I think a, a neat dictionary definition would say. And for me, that was super, super interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's funny because uh, I read that uh, a couple of days ago, the uh, um, you know story, and I remember thinking, "Wow, yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, if that were my friend, and and she's you know she's she's a lesbian, and she's telling me she slept with a man." I think, you know, and she's you know talking about being judged in um, in these queer spaces and people feeling like they um, can now speak on what she is, and I loved the ambivalence of you know at the end of it, she's sort of like, "This has just happened, and I'm just processing it," you know, and I'm sort of frustrated because I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know what to make of it, right? I had this desire, I acted on it. And I love the openness of that story because even she's like, I don't know, <laughs> I slept with a man. <laughs> you know, um, uh, I thought that was really wonderful. Like sexuality should be filled with like more ambivalence and openness mm -hmm. and discomfort, mm -hmm. um, right? Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. And I feel like, we should also learn to be comfortable in the, you know, ambivalence and not always feel like we need this really tightly defined label that we cannot like, you know, move freely within. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got ambivalence, we've got discomfort. And if, another theme that I wanted to think about is selfishness. Um, because, you know, when I was reading this and um, I was thinking about, you know, like when I think about what are some like core black feminist texts, I think Sula, right, is like, hmm. um, and in, in Sula, you have that line where she says, I don't want to make myself, I don't want to make somebody else. I want to make myself. Right. Mm -hmm. And that is like her comment on her, right. Rejecting heteronormativity, rejecting marriage, rejecting, you know, motherhood. I don't want to make somebody else. I want to make myself. And as I was reading this book, I thought, there's so many moments where women say, mm, I love this person, but I'm, I just, I'm not interested in this. And I thought that's so brazen, right? Like it is, and you know, there's nothing wrong with saying it's a selfishness. Right. Um, and so I wanted, yeah, I wanted to hear you think about like African women and selfishness and having this book be a space where women are able to say like, I want this thing. And you know, this person that I'm with doesn't want it. And I think it's okay that they don't want it. And I'm, you know, I'm okay maybe hurting someone's feelings. Uh, I'm okay letting this person go because of that. Yeah, no, I mean, you also reminded me of Estelle's story. You know, Estelle is, she's of mixed heritage. So Ghanaian, British, Syrian, Lebanese. And, you know, that was really her experience where she was, for all intents and purposes, in a happy marriage, but knew she wanted to explore her sexuality, knew she wasn't monogamous, and that's not who her husband was, right? And so she was like, yes, this marriage on the surface is good. My husband loves me. I love him, but I need to find myself. And I think it's actually a really brave thing to do, right? Because as women, we're socialized to want exactly that, right? A good husband, whatever that means, a happy marriage, whatever that means. And once you find that you're meant to be content, so what happens when you're not content? What happens when there's something within you that says there's more that you want to ex ex experience? And what happens when, yeah, you want to create space to experiment because we're never encouraged to experiment as girls. We're never encouraged to sell our wild oats. And so we actually found it really inspiring when women would be like, you know what? I want to try something different. I don't know what the future holds. I don't know if I'm going to have any regrets, but I am going to, yeah, step outside of the box and see what else is out there. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's what makes it, you know, thinking about like the whole question about that or animates this uh, series, like what makes a radical book. And I think that's where, you know, part of the radical potential lies is in like, you know, um, I think a reader who picks this up, that should push them a little bit, right? To read these stories of women who are behaving in ways that we would say like, this is a selfish choice, right? Um, you know, even that, I mean, the first, um, the first narrative that hits you, which is the BDSM one, right? And you're like, you know, ma, where she's, you know, sort of pushing her husband to, um, I forget the name now, right? Pushing her husband to like uh, try BDSM. 
And she's like, I started just going by myself. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I think that there is something really compelling about being able to read Black women, like foreground their desires so unapologetically, so, right, without making any sort of excuses. Like my husband was a little squeamish about BDSM. So we decided that I was going to do it. And I'm the one who really takes pleasure in it. And that's okay. Like, you know, because they're part of the labor of being, right, gendered as a woman is making things okay for other people. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I'm just reading these stories and it's like, no, he doesn't enjoy it. That's fine. I'm so I'm the one who's going to go to the dungeons. <laughs> right. Um, that was really exciting to me. Yeah, no, that was really exciting for me as well. You know, and one of the things another one of the women I interviewed, Alexis said, Alexis, she's an, a queer 70 year old African-American woman you know, mm. fell in love with her partner. They both fell in love with each other in their 60s, which for me was really, really inspirational. And one of the things she said that really stayed with me is that she and her partner had decided that, you know, Black people were never really encouraged to be in our bodies. We're never really encouraged to be decadent or hedonistic. And for mm. them, nothing they agreed to do, they were not going to see anything they'd agreed to do as perverse. You know, in fact, they were deliberately going to practice and cultivate decadence in their lives and in their sexual experiences with each other. And I thought that was beautiful. Yeah, I thought that was really beautiful. Yeah, I loved that story. Um, and I love, you know, um, how she talks about food as a real site of pleasure and the erotic yes. mm -hmm. and the way that they cook for each other, right? Absolutely. And, yeah, expanding our view of the erotic. Absolutely. Yes, totally. Yeah. Um, so yeah, to jump off from Alexa's story, I mean, one of the accomplishments of this book is that, I mean, I think that, you know, um, even for my own work, it's always like you, you do want to be, you do want to tell a really complete story of Blackness, of Africanness, but you know, like you can't capture, right, everyone. Mm -hmm. But this book really does like have such a breadth of experience. I mean, Alexis, is a 70 year old woman, right? You have trans women in this, um, in this book. So it's, there's a way in which um, much like the way that the story of queerness is uh, woven throughout this book, what it means to be black, what it means to be woman is really expanded throughout this book. So why was that important for you to be able to sort of have as broad, um, to be able to talk about blackness and queerness and womanhood in this really broad way that encompasses generations and like, you know, um, even location, like what is Africa, right, as a, as a geographic space, I think is really challenged by this book. Yes, and for me, that was really deliberate and it was also important. I identify as a Pan-Africanist, um, also I'm a feminist, you know, and part of what I've also been doing over the years is just connecting with Black feminists from across the globe. And until a few years ago, I had no idea of how truly vast the African diaspora is, right? I had no idea that there were really strong communities of African descendants in places like Honduras and Costa Rica. And when I realized that, my mind was really blown. And for me, it was important to, in a sense, show that breadth of African heritage um, in, in my book, right? In the same way, it was important for me to show the breadth of, of womanhood you know, show women as, as they are, whether they're cis, whether they're trans, whether they're sex workers, whether they're women with disabilities. It was just really important for me to, to show that breadth and that diversity, because I think that's, I think that's valuable. And I think that makes our experiences all the, all the richer. And one of the things that I've really loved hearing from people is how much they've just learned about other people and understood other people just by reading the book. You know, it's, it's been really good to hear that kind of feedback. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's such, um, because, of course, we know that your hand is through this book, right? Because you do interviews, and they don't, you know, you didn't just like reproduce them without sort of crafting something out of them. But I think um, a real achievement is that your hand is in there, but then it doesn't sort of, uh, right? There's some books that you read where the editor's hand then like takes over the narrative. So um, at the end, I noticed that you, um, 
you, you wrote part of it uh, during a fellowship. So I was wondering, like thinking about the craft of this, how did you write in such a way where your voice, your vision doesn't take over the voices of the subjects that you interviewed? Mm, that's a great question. I think for me, the important thing was to try and really understand as much from the person's point of view as possible, you know, to in a sense put them myself in their shoes because I was going to be writing in the first person to get a lot of detail from the people I was interviewing to, you know, know how they felt, what their partner looked like, what else was going on in their lives, what was happening in the environment around them. Um, yeah, that was like really, really important to me. And that was just what I tried to do. I, I wasn't trying to like impose my own views. You know, it was almost to just allow the person to channel the story through me. And yes, of course, you know, I had like an interview with someone and then wrote a story. So I did have to craft the story. Um, but what I tried to do was just to present and I guess the most compelling way what I'd had from my conversations with the women I interviewed. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very it's a very generous book, um, and so I'm glad that yeah, you were the person who who brought these stories to light. So I think that there's something unique that you are able to elicit from the people that you're talking to, and then the way that you put the, the narrative together. Um, so just a compelling feminist text in that regard. Um, so. So it's, this book has been out for like a year now. And so I was wondering what the reception has been like for you, um, uh, not only in Ghana, but just as the book has moved throughout the world, what have you know you gotten from people, women, um, patriarchs? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, how has this book moved through the world since it's been out? Yeah, so it first the first edition came out in the UK in July 2021, and then the US edition came oh, out oh. yeah this is the u.s edition I, I, I got the, yes yeah. the u.s edition came out in march this year 2022 the feedback has been extremely positive i just got back from a trip to kenya mm -hmm. um where <laughs> i was just like amazed at how people have taken the book to heart um bookshops there say it's been one of their best sellers a sign of that is the fact that the book has been pirated as well, which I'm told is what happens to really popular books. Is it a, is it a WhatsApp soft copy? Everyone says, <laughs> buy the book. You don't need a soft copy. Support the writer. I know. I was doing book signings and some people would come up with books for me to sign and I would say, I'm sorry, this is really not a legitimate copy of the book. Um, but yeah, for me, part of what has been really hard to women is for people to say to me, like, I identified with so many stories. I've never felt so seen before. Um, the feedback has been incredible, really, just affirming. Yeah, yeah. One of my thoughts is, like, I have so many people that I'm definitely going to buy this book for because I want, I like, I want them to read it and then I want to, like, watch them while they read it. And <laughs> off the book because... There are so many, I mean, you know, my friends and I are pretty frank about sex, but there's so many things where I'm like, wow, you know, even, even we haven't talked, you know, we haven't talked about, mm. anything, right, in terms of our own vulnerabilities, um, and the way that, you know, um, we can get hurt, and the way that we make ourselves open to people as Black women, right, mm -hmm. um, uh, that's a really hard place to go, I think, in terms of uh, really expressing that. Because I think even me as like a feminist, I think part of how I've embodied it is a certain kind of invulnerability. Like, you know, I'm a black woman, I'm an African woman and I can handle my shit. Mm. And part of what this book does is like, you can handle your shit, but it gets a little yeah. hard out here. <laughs> True. True. Um, and, you know, and, um, and I think that's really important. Um, and so I wanted you to talk maybe about, you know, um, the choice to then include your narrative at the end, um, and which is beautiful, which is hard, which is so many things, um, vulnerable, right? 
uh, it really takes us there. So I wanted to hear you see it, sort of the process of putting that at the end of the book um, and writing that story. Yeah, no, when I started this book project, to be honest, I hadn't thought of including my own story. You know, I thought, oh yeah, I'm going to interview as many women as possible. And then once I'd done about 20 interviews, it became really clear to me that I needed to put myself on the line, really. I couldn't ask people to be vulnerable, to share their deepest secrets with me and then share that with the world and not really put myself on the line. I felt like it was an important part of feminist practice to to do that, right? Um, I definitely didn't want to come across as like the anthropologist, you know, looking at people and then just writing about them. And yeah, I think that was important. And I, I think it's also really just true of how we are as feminists in terms of sharing stories with one another, learning from one another. And it was just something I had to do, really. It was just something I had to do, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's a really um, compelling choice. And, you know, when I finished that book, um, I felt such a sense of like, completeness because I thought, yeah, it really kind of, um, I mean, this is going taking us to places, but I've just been thinking of a lot about this problem of, you know, um, being a desiring subject and like what it means to be a desiring subject and for black people to express desire, right? Um, in a world that is structured against us. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and like this book helps us to think about that question in a really compelling way. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, you know, in thinking about this book as uh, a document, uh, right, uh, the, a book has a certain kind of materiality. And, you know, part of the promise, the potential of a book as an object is that it will outlive its author, it will, you know, right, right, immortalize the author in some sort of way. Um, and in Amina's story, uh, right, one of the anchor points of that story is that she finds women and sex by Nawal El Sadawi, and this book kind of activates, right, her feminist consciousness. So this book is going to have an afterlife, right? Um, it's a material thing. Uh, we'll, if we still have libraries, um, it will be in a library. It will certainly be in the collections of African women that their children sneak, right? They'll see this title. I'm even like, right? <laughs> Imagine me as a 10 year old seeing the title on my mom's bookshelf. I would have been like, yeah, <laughs> I would read that and get in trouble. Um, so who is the subject, the young person that you imagine stumbling upon this in their mother's collection, not at least sneaking this book off? <laughs> I mean, I think one of the favorite things that people have said to me is that they're going to gift this to their daughters, right? People who even don't have daughters yet have said they're going to gift this to their daughters. I dedicated the book to my daughter, Asantua, right? Because I think from this book, you get the knowledge that a lot of us didn't get growing up for a whole host of reasons. And there's no better way to learn than from, you know, than from like, people who could be your sisters, your mothers, your aunties, your friends. And yeah, I just imagine this book as for women and girls, wherever they are in their lives. Um, one of the things I've also enjoyed people saying to me is this book has made me question my sexuality. It's made me want to start my own journey of self-discovery. And I feel like you can do that no matter what age you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I know it's not the point of the book, but then I, when I was reading this, I was like, I need to be having better sex. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, <laughs> we all do. <laughs> I was like, you know, um, yeah, there's really no excuse. It's like, you, you know, one really gets a sense from this, like, no, this is, you can take charge and you can really articulate what you want. There's no reason not to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And if that's what the book does in the world, my mission here has been accomplished. <laughs> yeah. I, th- I think it will. Right. I think it will. And I mean, when we think about, you know, the radical potential of African feminism, right, a lot of us are working and living in contexts where, you know, governed by what Grace Musila has called philocracies, right? Uh, um, these nation states that are just, uh, right, so structured by this um, patriarchal nationalism. 
So like this book can make a space out, out of and through that. And I wonder like, who in Africa in which this book would be on an A-level syllabus? <laughs> you know, like truly, I mean, you know, that that is something like, that is that is a future Africa that we can imagine. Like this book, you know, there's some sort of uh, curriculum, gender studies curriculum that is part of the high school education, part of, you know, um, and this book would be on some sort of A-level list. <laughs> that will be amazing. That will truly be amazing. <laughs> That's definitely a future that I want to be a part of. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's what um, is so exciting about this book and what it opens up and what it makes, um, yeah, what it makes possible. Um, so I don't know if you had any last words uh, or anything that you wanted us to think about um, in terms of this book and um, yeah. Well, just in terms of last words, I mean, I, th- I feel like one of the things I personally took away from the book from the women I interviewed was that, you know, there's no one way of healing. There are different ways in which to find healing. A lot of us have experienced truly traumatic, you know, things. And I think it's important to take the space and time to heal, but it's also important to recognize that healing is not one dimensional. You know, for some people, sex was healing. For some people, um, practice on celibacy was healing for some people healing was going on a spiritual retreat and I guess my encouragement would be to people to figure out and make space to find out what healing for them looks like Mm. yeah yeah um thank you so much for that and thank you for making that space for African women to heal through the labor of love that produced this book Thank you so much. Yeah, Thank you. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for making the time. Thank you. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Mm-hmm.